Coronavirus and an economic lockdown gripping America. The stress of everything is the unknown. Central Florida families forced into a financial fight to survive. But is the system working? I can't even get a hold of anyone, not a single human being. News 6 took your unemployment concerns to top leaders in the state. For my part, I apologize for what you're going through. And sought answers from lawmakers on what's at stake. My main concern is Main Street rather than Wall Street. Now it's your turn to ask the questions, get solutions, and find resources to protect your finances and your future. Thank you for joining News 6 Live on ClickOrlando.com for Central Florida's financial fight. That's what it is right now. And this is a town hall focused on providing you the resources you need during the coronavirus pandemic. And News 6 is teaming up with Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings for this digital event. We also have Pam Neighbors, President and CEO of Career Source Central Florida. Dr. Sean Snaith, the Director of the University of Central Florida's Institute for Economic Forecasting. Tim Giuliani, president and CEO of the Orlando Economic Partnership. He will swap out with Dr. Snaith about halfway through. And News 6 investigative reporter Mike DeForest, who has extensively covered the unemployment struggles many Floridians have faced in recent weeks. I want to start with Mayor Demings, though. Let's, uh, let's begin. Why did you want to team up with News 6 for this town hall event, Mayor? I really thought that it is important for us to have a dialogue with our community, especially during this period of a pandemic. We have a number of citizens who have a lot of anxiety associated with the various uh, shelter in place orders, ex et cetera, in our community. And because of the economic impact that this is really having on our community, I wanted to have a dialogue with certain people within this community who can reassure our citizens that uh, things will get better. Mayor Demings, thank you so much. Uh, our whole panel, we appreciate you guys being here tonight, open to answering these questions. And I want to let you know, if you're watching this right now on ClickOrlando.com or on Facebook or wherever you are seeing this online, feel free to comment and ask these questions. I have a team of people right over here who are going to be running those questions to me. I will then get those questions to the people who know the answer. So we appreciate you participating with us today. And uh, I would like to start with Dr. Sean Snaith. Uh, Dr. Snaith, I know you've had some very interesting economic forecasts coming out this week, maybe scared a few people with the timelines on that. So we have a question tonight from Abe coming in. Abe wants to know about the projected economic downfall. What kind of jobs will be available when this is all done and how will it compare to the pre-coronavirus market? Uh, well, I think the answer to these questions really uh, lies with how long the various public health measures remain in effect. Uh, you know, you said this is a fight. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, the first thought that popped in my mind, it's sort of like the movie Fight Club where we're, we're, we're punching ourselves. Uh, you know, this recession, which is, is deeper and more severe than the Great Recession, is a direct function of uh, the public health measures that we've implemented. So we've pulled the plug on, on large swaths of the economy and it's, you know, it's unleashed uh, you know, this economic turmoil. Um, but before, you know, pre-pandemic, pre the economy was in great shape. The labor market uh, in Florida, and particularly in central Florida, was extremely strong. So this was a very healthy economy before we ran into this pandemic. And so, you know, I, I'm of the feeling that, uh, you know, the sooner we can ease up on these uh, social distancing and stay at home uh, measures, the more rapidly the economy will be able to recover. The longer these measures remain in place, I think the, the deeper the downturn, the greater the damage, and the longer the climb uh, back out of this hole. But right now, uh, you know, I think by the time we get to the fourth quarter of, of 2020, the economy should be uh, doing very well and, and growing very robustly. Uh, the labor market, you know, may take a few more quarters, uh, you know, to fully recover from this uh, this sharp downturn. Uh, Dr. Snaith, I've heard people say that this is either going to be a U or some people refer to it as a V. I'm curious as to which camp you're in as far as a more the U being a more gradual upturn. Right. 
Right. So the the the, the, the I, I was probably originally in in, in the V camp, um, thinking that the, uh, the public health measures were going to be very short in duration, and so I felt that you know we could unplug the economy for a couple of weeks, a month, and then turn everything back on and, and sort of get back to where we were very quickly. Uh, I think it's going to uh, be somewhere between a V uh, and, a, and, a, and a U. Um, and it, uh, there's a lot of variables here, you know, the various federal programs, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank's measures that were announced today, how quickly can they uh, be implemented, how quickly will their uh, effects be felt. So there's a lot of things that, that can kind of shift this. But, you know, going back to my, my comments earlier, I mean, at the heart of the matter are the public health measures that we put in place. That is what's caused the damage to the economy. This is not a natural recession born out of the mechanisms uh, and, and, and normal functioning of a market economy. Yeah, the infrastructure there beforehand was good. Uh, one of the most important things we're going to talk about tonight is jobs. And while many jobs have been lost, numbers just came out today, 6.6 .6 million people filing for unemployment in the last week. There are some opportunities out there. I want to bring in Pam neighbors now. So, so Pam, we got a question in uh, just a bit ago. We know there are so many people out there struggling without jobs. We also know that there are some jobs available in industries that just can't even keep up with the current demand. They're being overrun. So what are some of those jobs and how can Central Florida, Floridians go about applying for them? So yes, Matt, there are many jobs actually being uh, spawned because of the crisis that we're in. So at Career Source Central Florida, we are very busy helping businesses and helping career seekers, job seekers uh, access the jobs that are available. And as you can imagine, many of the jobs are in areas like healthcare, like customer service and contact center, like delivery um, and uh, grocers and things like that. And so just today, um, we are actually actively recruiting for FANUEL, customer service, you've probably heard about that is also supporting the reemployment process, as well as uh, HCA Health Services, Advent Health. We're also recruiting for uh, Florida Blue. The Guidewell is at adding 200 new, or I'm sorry, 50 new customer service. Um, there are many jobs also in, um, again, that customer service contact area in a number of different industries. Um, Elrica, which is a temporary uh, customer care center, is also actively recruiting. And so it's very important that you do go to the Career Source Central Florida website, www.careersourcecentralflorida.com, or also call our 1 800 number, which is 1 800 757. 4598. Actually, we have staff who are constantly manning our contact center and will get you with a career consultant to, to tell you about the jobs and also to help you to update that resume, update your virtual presence. You know, a lot of people that are having to go into the job market right now are not familiar with actually navigating online applications and virtual interviews. And so those are very important things that we're helping individuals to do. All right, Pam, thank you. And I know you've been dealing with a lot of people, about 27,000 people you told me earlier uh, have come in there since March. We'll get back to you uh, with many more questions on trying to find a job in uh, this crazy situation we find ourselves in. I want to get back to Mayor Demings uh, right now. Mayor, we got a question in, this one from Richard. He wants to know if Florida mayors like yourself are going to ask the governor to put a hold on certain things. He's thinking property taxes, driver's license renewals, tag renewals, maybe for the next three months. He says right now every penny counts. What are the possibilities of something like that happening, Mayor? I think we have ongoing conversations really with the governor's office and uh, the other governmental subdivisions about what we really need to do to ensure that we do everything that we can to assist in returning our economy to where it was. It may take uh, some sensible measures being put in place where we delay uh, some of the renewal things and uh, we have an upcoming election season, for example. We are going to have to make certain that we meet the needs of that election season with all of the various deadlines. So I believe that we're going to operate in a, uh, an, an area where this is going to be a new normal for all of us. Uh, many of the government programs that we have been offering where you would go in and actually interact with a human being, much of that is going to change. There's going to be more of an opportunity, I believe, to uh, actually do online applications and do online renewals and a number of other things, perhaps even a vote uh, through the Internet. 
all of that is something that the governor and, and the cabinet is going to have to take into consideration as we move forward. However, I must say that our local governments and state government must still function unlike the federal government where they can run deficits. We have to balance our budgets. We cannot spend funds that we do not have in our bank accounts. And in order to better serve the citizens of uh, Florida and of our local communities, uh, we have to continue having the cash flow to be able to operate to serve the people themselves. And so there won't be a situation where we can just simply not collect property taxes and do all those other things that we have to have in order to have the cash flow to serve. It is a delicate balance. Uh, Florida already one of the lower taxed states in the country. So, but an interesting question, and uh, the options are there possibly to be on the table. Hopefully this doesn't last that long, Mayor. Thank you. I want to get to our investigative reporter, Mike DeForest. We have been flooded. That's the assignment desk behind me back there. Emails, phone calls, all sorts of people dealing with this unemployment crisis, trying to get relief and really having absolutely no success with it. So Mike has been covering this extensively, uh, dealing with people who are trying to get these unemployment benefits. So tell us, Mike, what have you seen as far as the problems and how they started as to where we are today as things have hopefully gotten better in the last few weeks? Well, over the last couple of weeks, Matt, we have heard from, uh, I've lost count of how many emails and phone calls I've received personally, people asking me for help trying to navigate the state's unemployment benefit system. And uh, uh, they are, you, you've heard the stories, they can't get through on the internet. The phone lines are jammed. I'm a little blessed in my role that I have a little bit different channel that I can go through uh, to reach some of the head people at the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity to hopefully get answers that then I can tell uh, more people about. Unfortunately, even I'm having a tough time trying to get answers from that state agency. I'm going to chalk it up to the fact that even they are slammed with things changing by the day. Uh, the good news is these horror stories that we've heard over the last couple weeks about people not being able to apply for unemployment benefits on the website and the phone lines. Uh, just last night, uh, the department opened up a brand new website. It appears to be a completely new redesign from the bottom up website. And we are hearing some very good stories today people who are having success. Not always, but at least it looks like that internet log jam uh, is um, freeing up. Uh, Miss Neighbors mentioned just a moment ago Faniel, this uh, call center company that was contracted by the state of Florida to uh, get bodies there to answer phones so you can actually talk to a human being. I think that's what's very reassuring for some folks uh, when they can get to a human being and that's not been happening much. And that's why we're seeing a lot of this frustration, this anxiety. And when people do submit their applications either online or now with these paper applications. They're sending them off into the ether and not knowing when are I going to get my money. And I will tell you that is one question I have had for state officials. When is the money going to show up when people successfully apply for unemployment benefits? We are not getting that answer, Matt. They don't want to commit to it yet. And that is the one answer everybody really wants to know. I do want to send it back over to Pam. Pam, uh, there are places in your offices where people can pick up these paper applications is that really the best way to do it, though? What If you're going to try to get your money quickly, is it better to go paper or to fill out to, or to try to wait it out on the Internet? So I am very encouraged by the mobile site. I have also heard some good news stories today. And I've also heard from a few of the job seekers that we've talked to that have actually been able to get through on the actual website. We do have the paper applications out in front of our Career Source Central Florida offices. The department and the governor asked us to be able to provide that to individuals. We've also shipped them out to key community organizations and our partners at the county and the city um, to make sure that they're available. But I would say that I, I would I would encourage people to try the mobile site and try the website because paper and the department is saying the paper applications are just potentially going to take longer. And if you've already submitted and you've been able to get through with a claim number, then don't submit a paper application because they are going to create a system to be able to make sure they don't duplicate um, at those paper apps. I just worry that there are many, many paper apps. We've had a lot of paper apps taken already. We are um, actually publishing them by the thousands. Um, but I do feel like the website and the mobile app are going to be um, continuing to be improving. You know, it's a very frustrating time. This virus is a very scary thing. And all of the agencies that are dealing with it have never dealt with the volume of need that they're seeing right now. 
And so we're frustrated here at Career Source Central Florida. We're focused on how do we help people focus on the employment side. We talk to them. We answer what we can about the applications. We tell them what documents they need to have together. It's very important that you have all of the the documents that are required in that list is also available, pointed to on our website at the coronavirus support page. But um, I do believe as we go through the next week that we will see more and more applications moving through. Yeah, I would imagine so, uh, Pam. It's just an emotional, stressful time for people right now. I, I read a tweet tonight from the uh, House of Representatives, Jose Oliva, the Speaker of the Florida House, that I'd like to bring up. I'd like to ask Dr. Snaith about this. This is what he's saying tonight. The economy is shuttered, unemployment is at historic highs, but the stock market is having a great week. No amount of forward looking can account for this disparity. The financial sector is again the greatest beneficiary of this stimulus. This will not end well in the long run. I found this fascinating coming from the head of Florida's House of Representatives tonight. Dr. Snaith, what's your take on that? Well, you know, I, I think financial markets are, are forward looking. And I, I think the reactions that we're seeing, I mean, in part, certainly uh, the Federal Reserve's policies, uh, unprecedented, the, the, the rapid pace with which the federal government came through with their stimulus program. Um, but I think more importantly, what may be driving financial markets higher is this continuing downward revision in the number of anticipated deaths uh, that, that are being projected by the, these, these various models. I mean, we started off early in this pandemic, uh, the number of one to two million dead in the United States is being thrown around. As more data comes in, these models are getting revised and the numbers have been getting revised in one direction and that's downward. And I think we heard today uh, 60,000. Uh, and so now we're, now we're looking at numbers and you know, not to minimize 60,000 deaths, but that is not out of line with the normal uh, seasonal flu season in terms, of, uh, in terms of the number of deaths that it causes. So, you know, I, I think the stock market may be looking at that saying, okay, this isn't going to be a six-month episode where the economy's turned off, that, you know, maybe this thing is going to be up and running uh, by the end of May. Uh, the stimulus, I think, will ease some of the pain, but it's certainly not going to make the economy whole by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, as your, your previous comments and, and questions reflect, uh, it takes time uh, for this money. As quickly as the government moved, it still takes time to go through the channels and through a system that was never built to handle this kind of influx. Unemployment uh, is usually a lagging uh, indicator of where the business cycle is, and it's a gradual uh, process. I mean, we in the past three weeks have seen more uh, unemployed people than uh, the entirety of, of, the, of the Great Recession. And that took almost 16 months for unemployment to, to reach these levels. So, you know, this is coming fast and furious. Uh, and, you know, you design a system based on, you know, historical needs. And, uh, you know, we're making history uh, with what's happening in the economy today. Yeah, and the projected deaths that has gone significantly down from 100,000 to 240,000 in the best case scenario to now down, down to 80 last week and then to 60. Uh, so it's certainly something economists are keeping an eye on as well as healthcare professionals. Dr. Snaith, thank you. Uh, I've got a question in here from Bob. I think we have a full screen for this one. This one goes to Mayor Demings as well. Bob's worried about keeping all of the craft stores open right now. He says it could pose a risk to the community. So the real question in this is, what was the process when it came to deciding what essential businesses are allowed to operate, Mayor? Uh, what went into making the determination which were essential businesses and non-essential, it all uh, was related to those that are related to the um, health, life, health, safety of our community and making certain that we're able to maintain the infrastructure of uh, government at all levels. I will tell you that we looked at some models from around the country. Uh, we looked at um, some of what the, the governor was recommending. Ultimately, as you know, the governor issued uh, an order of his own, but up until that point, the local communities were pretty much left to their own decision-making authority to decide which were essential businesses or not. 
But here within Orange County, uh, that's what I did. I looked at which businesses were essential to life, health, and safety related matters. So if uh, your business was a, a, a medical facility, a pharmacy, if you were part of the food distribution chain, if you were key to the safety and security of, uh, of a business, if you were healthcare related, uh, those businesses we said were essential businesses. And then we had to look at the type of businesses that were not essential. And the ultimate goal was really to minimize the spread of the virus here within our community. I think that it was absolutely pivotal for this community when the largest single site employer in America, that being Walt Disney World, decided that they would close their doors and then the other theme parks uh, follow. That decision, I think, was very crucial to stopping the spread of, of the virus within our community and perhaps uh, across America and perhaps across the globe itself because we are the number one tourist destination really in America with 75 million tourists who will come here on an annual basis. On top of that, we had the business airport here in the state of Florida. All of those things helped to fuel this uh, economy of ours. And so when decisions were being made by those businesses to shut down, they based it upon protecting the people and not protecting their profits. So I do give some accolades to uh, our theme parks for what they did to lead the way in that regard. I think it was the right decision. Without us being the government saying you must shut down, they uh, made that decision voluntarily. And so there were some other businesses that we said that were not uh, necessarily crucial to uh, the uh, life, health, and safety of our community, and unfortunately, they shut down. The goal was, again, to uh, do that to stop the spread of the virus. I believe that if you look at the data now, uh, that uh, will likely prove to have been a successful decision-making point for us. Now the goal really is all about getting the businesses reopened. We have to balance that, however, with the science behind uh, the, the healthcare system and what our medical community is telling us, uh, because we do want to uh, ensure that lives are not lost. So we have to have measured approaches as we begin to, at some point, reopen our community. That will be a decision that we'll make in consultation with the healthcare community as well as the business community. Uh, I plan to impanel a group of individuals here locally that will work in partnership with the state so that there's some uniformity in how uh, we roll that uh, out. I will say that there will likely be uh, some provisions that have been put in place along the lines of uh, protocols related, related to uh, sanitary uh, uh, protocols within our community that will remain probably for some period of time uh, so that we can continue to protect the public against the possibility that there could be uh, a resurgence of the virus uh, later in the summer months, if you will. So we're monitoring all of that. And I had a great call today with our hospital CEOs of the major hospital systems here in the area, uh, Orlando Health, Advent Health, and the HCA uh, systems. And one of the things that the hospital said to me was that uh, what they're seeing at this point in terms of uh, the COVID patients who uh, must be hospitalized, they're seeing an average daily reduction in the number of patients that they're seeing in the hospital, the num uh, reduction in the number who are critically uh, ill who need to, to be in ICU units. So they're managing that. All of those are good indicators to us that um, some of the decisions to restrict social movement really worked early on. And I think the sooner we got to that, the sooner we're able to recover and return our economy to the robust economy that Dr. Snaith talked about just a few moments ago. Mayor, you bring up something really important, getting back to some semblance of normal, getting these theme parks open, which obviously is the main driver of our economy. I know a lot of the people are watching are folks who have are facing furloughs from either Disney or Universal. Universal just came out today and said it's gonna stay closed until May 31st. Right now, Disney is until further notice. So from the projections we have right now, and I know they change every day, I wanna ask a little more specifically, is there a month in mind you're looking at where you might be a little more comfortable 
with these theme parks opening up, at least at this point? What I can tell you is from the conversation that we've had with our health care uh, providers, uh, they have looked at some of the best predictive models around the country. But th what they have done is also perfect their models based on our local experience, what we're seeing here in our community. And those predictive models uh, suggest that we could peak next week in terms of the total number of new cases uh, to sometime in early May. So if we look at the latter portion of May, uh, if those models are correct and accurate, we will have peaked and we should see a decline in that curve at that point. And we may be able to begin to relax some of the restrictions that we have put in place. And what that really looks like as a community, we're still having that dialogue because again, I think that uh, we will base that decision on the science behind the uh, of the healthcare data that we is being collected across the country, but also being collected right here in our community. It could mean that certain businesses will be allowed to reopen, but there still may be some mandates regarding the type of social distancing that may be in place. Uh, some of our businesses may be able to reopen and there may be a mandate that requires us some type of screening uh, be put in place, such as taking the temperatures of individuals entering. Uh, we really want to get after the testing. We want to improve the testing that's being done in our community and some of the efficacy related to the testing to ensure that uh, from a medical perspective, uh, we know what type of uh, treatment is in order to help hopefully prevent uh, a secondary surge from occurring in the late summer months. So we're looking at this very comprehensively. What we've said uh, as a community, we are looking at uh, our recovery efforts more of, uh, from a perspective of being a regional response uh, because really the way our community works is not really just county by county. So I can tell you within our region, uh, Orange, Lake, Seminole, and Osceola County, have, the leadership in those counties have come together to say that uh, let's have a consistent and uniform ways of approaching this as we go forward. And so I'm uh, really encouraged by that because really up until uh, recently, everyone was kind of doing their own thing. I'm happy to report that we had great conversations today with uh, Governor DeSantis and his team uh, from the Florida Department of Emergency Management. So we know that if our hospitals exceed their capacity, uh, we have a, a contingency plan so that we could stand up, fill hospitals here in our area very quickly to be able to uh, care for those who would uh, need uh, uh, health care. Okay, Mayor. Uh Thank you. So basically, it's going to be a high wire act trying to figure out when we can open things back up again. I heard you say maybe late summer. So I'm, I'm well, gonna... actually, I, uh, I, uh, I'll clarify that. I think by the June period of time, if we see the numbers, uh, even though today in Orange County we have 860 uh, individuals uh, who have tested positive for the virus in our community, uh, we've had uh, now 13 people who have died from it. And, uh, you know, we certainly um, have concern for those families who have lost a loved one. But I believe given the predictive models, it could be June, uh, early June, uh, when we see some relaxing of uh, the restrictions that's in place. But they will have to stay in place uh, to some degree uh, through, uh, through uh, late summer. And, but again, what that looks like, I believe that many of our businesses will be able to reopen. I'm optimistic. I think that that June period of time may be the period of time uh, where we can see uh, some relief in our community. Yeah. We all know one thing is for sure, we cannot stay closed uh, forever, but it is, it is nice to hear some sort of possible timeline. I won't hold you to it uh, just yet, Mayor. I understand. Uh, I got a uh, question in for Dr. Snaith. Um, Dr. Snaith, this person's asking, what can we do to diversify our economy to ensure that we're not so hard hit like this in the future? Do you have any ideas on that? Well, you know, I, I think uh, this community uh, learned a lesson and has been working uh, very hard, uh, not, not just this community, but the, the, the state, statewide as well, that, you know, you don't want to have too many of your economic eggs in one basket. And, and I think after the 9-11, uh, 
uh, attacks. There were efforts here in our region to push forward with diversifying the economy. Uh, you know, Orange County, uh, City of Orlando governments, economic development organizations uh, have been uh, working on this. And I think that uh, you know, this, this blow would be more severe had we not made the progress that we've made over the past uh, 18, 19 years to do so. And, you know, you can look at uh, Medical City uh, is one example of that. You know, the, the, the leisure and hospitality sector has continued to thrive, um, but other sectors have grown uh, as well. And so, you know, we see job creation in professional and business services and healthcare, uh, you know, and, and, and sectors of the economy well outside, you know, traditional tourism related jobs. And, you know, we've got, uh, you know, a large education sector uh, here in, in Central Florida. You know, we've got optics, simulation, uh, you know, the space industry and its ties back uh, here to, uh, to, to our community. Um, so we've made progress and, um, you know, tourism isn't going to go away. Uh, you know, that is a, a, a gift in many ways to our region's economy. It provides a lot of opportunity. It generates a lot of revenue. Um, for for our governments, for our schools, um, for our first responders, um, but we have made progress, and I think those efforts are, are ongoing and, and uh, will continue to happen. Um, but you know, tourism is always going to be part of the the Orlando economic picture. Who would have known that basing a big part of our economy around huge groups of people getting together in the same place would be such an issue for us uh, at a time like this, Dr. Snaith? Thank you very much for that response. Definitely the most amount of questions we are getting into News 6 these days has to do with unemployment and trying to get your benefits. I want to direct this question uh, to Pam Neighbors. Pam, this person says, for those who aren't able to apply for unemployment benefits right now, what other options for them are available? So there are a lot of things that you can do. Um, most importantly is that you should be actively tuning up your own uh, job search activities. So at CareerSource Central Florida, we're doing a number of things to support our community. First of all, we have enhanced our website. There is, as I mentioned, a coronavirus support page that has a lot of the resources, not just for the reemployment system, but actually also for getting employment. So registering with the Employee Florida system, as well as also looking and working with our career consultants and our staff who are all working virtually. We've really seen a tremendous uh, increase in customers. We've pretty much in the month of March served over 20,000 people virtually. With a lot of services I mentioned earlier about tuning up that resume, but also there are opportunities to, uh, next week we'll be rolling out some free training that is online, training in a lot of different kinds of, of uh, industries and disciplines. So there's some basic training, but also some computer training, Microsoft Office Suite, for example. There are some coding um, opportunities, and so we hope to stand that opportunity up next week through the website. Additionally, we have been actually reaching out to our community partners in the humanitarian efforts because there are a lot of people that now cannot get to places they needed to before, for example, seniors to get to uh, centers for meals. And so CareerSource Central Florida has actually dedicated about a half a million dollars in internships where we can take some of our dislocated workers, those folks that are looking for employment or waiting to go back to work, and put them to work if they're interested in actually doing driving and drop off um, for our humanitarian outreach. We're crafting a partnership with the Four Roots Foundation in food delivery, um, the Osceola Council on Aging. And so again, if you're interested in doing some of those opportunities, and also they are paid, they will be paid opportunities at about $14 an hour. Again, please go to our website and call our contact center and we will get you to a person to talk through those different programs and services. We're also launching a podcast in another week or so. We're actually gonna be talking about uh, ways that you can get access to the resources that we're talking about tonight as well as, again, get your job search ready. Where can you look in Central Florida for opportunities? You know, uh, Dr. Snaith talked about those growing industries. Career Source has been very focused on training in the in information technology. As you can imagine, cybersecurity is an enormous area for training. We work with our partners at the state colleges, Valencia and Seminole State and Lake Sumter State College, as well as Orlando or Orange Tech. 
um, and Lake Technical College, and we are continuing to work in online ways to get people different kinds of training and certification. So many resources are available in this time that we're waiting to be able to get back to work. So please be sure to check those out. Yeah, and Pam, you talked about some of those internships. Uh, and some businesses' internships are free. That one's paying about 14 bucks an hour, so that is, that is some good pay right there. Thank you for those resources. We appreciate you. We're bringing in a new member of our panel right now. I want to show you Tim Giuliani. He is the president and CEO of the Orlando Economic Partnership. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Tim deals a lot with businesses, some big, some small. And Tim, I want to start you off with a question we have from Mitch here. He owns an LLC. He wants to know whether he's eligible for a pay tech, uh, paycheck protection program loan. Way easier to just say PPP. To expand on that, who can apply for this funding? What are the stipulations that come along with it? Yeah, thanks. We're getting a lot of these questions, um, and, and I feel, you know, I have some notes here. I feel probably like many of you um, that have small businesses trying to figure out um, what to do, and, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program is certainly one option. I think the important thing for small businesses to know is, you know, now is definitely the time to be investigating all of these opportunities even if you might not ultimately need it, depending on the length of time uh, that the economy um, is in its current position, it's worth going ahead and moving forward with these applications. Um, in Florida, because we have hurricanes, our state actually has an emergency loan program that would probably be the first stop. Uh, that's meant to be uh, quick. Um, I think our state has a lot of experience dealing with these types of loans because of hurricanes. Now, typically that's located in one part of the state, whereas this is impacting the entire state. Uh, so they too are a little bit slower than normal, but the emergency loan program is through the state. And then the Paycheck Protection Program is available to most businesses and even 501c3 nonprofits. There's also um, emergency loan program uh, through the SBA in addition. Um, and tax credits available. So really, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm a small business right now, I'm on the phone with my accountant, I'm on the phone with my banker, I'm on the phone with my attorney, trying to understand uh, which of these to apply. To get started, the easiest way is to go to orlando.org slash COVID-19, where all of these resources have been put together for small businesses. Uh, Tim, thank you for that resource. I do want to let you know if you're watching this, whether it's clickorlando.com or social media, wherever it is, any of these resources you're hearing our guests talk about, we are putting those in one place here at clickorlando.com. If you'd like to check it out, we'll have the links and the phone numbers all there for you so you can find those resources when you need them. We got a question for Mayor Demings. Uh, Jennifer, she works in the convention and events industry. She wants to know what steps right now are being taken to encourage that convention business to come back to Orlando. Is that happening right now, Mayor? A lot is going on with that. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the shows that either uh, canceled, uh, decided to actually not totally cancel, but postpone. They have rebooked at later dates. So we believe that um, by creating some incentives for them to be able to do that, typically whenever a show books, uh, and they cancel and it uh, doesn't meet one of the criteria within the contract, uh, there's a cancellation penalty, uh, huge penalties that they have to pay. What we're doing is working with some of those shows to, if they rebook within a certain period of time, we waive those penalties. And so we have a number of them that we have rebooked and we believe that there will uh, likely be some pent up demand for uh, smaller conferences here within our community. We want to be able to get our hotels back to the occupancy levels where they were before. Uh, we will continue to market at an appropriate time. Uh, obviously, what we're experiencing here is not unique to Orange County. This is something that is happening all across America, all across the world. And I believe that uh, as we, as a c community, come out of this uh, COVID-19 uh, challenge that we have, we'll be one of the first communities, hopefully, to see a uh, resurgence in our uh, economy returning. Uh, we are going to continue to make certain that we're able to offer a good deal for the people to come here. So we're working across the hotel lodging industry uh, along with our convention and leisure industry to make sure that we're offering a quality product. The Orange County Convention Center is uh, the second largest convention center in the nation. And uh, it is a convention center that remains uh, 
uh, really um, one of the pristine uh, properties uh, in our community. It has uh, all of the most current uh, technology there. And so we want to make certain that we're able to compete. We're continuing with our expansion efforts. Uh, fortunately, Orange County uh, is in good fiscal shape and we're able to continue even the construction project that was at the convention center. Uh, that is something that we may have to look at. Uh, do we phase that in or do we continue to do the entire project? Uh, but we uh, remain competitive and uh, I'm uh, very optimistic that uh, within just a few months, hopefully by fall, we'll be uh, back in good shape. And then our healthcare industry, we hope that they have uh, more information about a possible vaccine. We know that that may take a year, but uh, the antiviral medications that could be made available, uh, we can see them coming hopefully faster uh, than uh, the, the, a year. Uh, all of that will help, I think, reassure people that it's safe to come here, to travel here. So we're looking at new technologies to, within our convention space as well to make sure that, again, uh, it speaks to the overall safety and the quality of the uh, event center that we have here. Yeah, there is something depressing about those millions of square feet just being desolate right now. It just does not seem right, Mayor. We've got a question in for our investigator now, Mike DeForest. Mike, Debbie says she worked Orange County Convention Center for 25 years, noticing a theme here, a lot of convention center workers, and she has used all of her benefits, so she was already using those benefits. How can she get the 13-week extension the president promised when, uh, when that is put into effect? So basically, uh, and we've heard this question from a few people out there, if you have already used up your benefits for the year or maybe you were already on when all of this started, how do you go ahead and, and get into that federal system as well? And let me just give you a quick explainer on this. Um, so the state of Florida provides benefits maximum of $275 a week for 12 weeks uh, because of the CARES Act that was passed by Congress a couple weeks ago. Uh, you will get an additional $600 on top of your maximum $275 here in Florida. And it also extends the period from 12 weeks to an additional 13 weeks. Um, there are some people uh, like her who uh, have obtained their state benefits already, they've exhausted them, um, that federal money is going to be routed through the state system. So the same place that you go to apply for state benefits, you will eventually be receiving those federal funds through the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Now, um, what is supposed to happen is that there is only one application you fill out, be it uh, the, the website, the paper application, um, and the people who work for that agency will determine what you are eligible for, and if you are eligible for those federal funds, um, it should in a perfect world, hopefully automatically uh, transition to you and you'll receive those payments. Um, a question I have not had answered from uh, the state agency yet is when folks like her should begin to start applying. Um, if you go on their website right now, uh, floridajobs.org, there's a frequently asked questions page and it does talk about uh, your eligibility for federal funds under the CARES Act and that you will be applying through that state system. Um, it does not appear that the state is openly advertising saying, hey, Hey, even if you're not eligible for state funds, go ahead and file your application now. We're not hearing that from the state. Um, I don't know necessarily that it would hurt either because that's the, the process that will eventually be uh, working. I can only just tell you what the state is sharing with us now. But uh, at the end of the day, that is where it's going to come from, from those state applications. The time frame again, we do not know. We do know in the, just the last week, the state has been working with their counterparts in Washington, D.C. to determine how that money is going to get here, how it's going to be distributed. So we don't have the timeline answers, uh, but it's all going to be coming through uh, the state system, whether you are eligible or not for state benefits. Mike, whenever you say things like in a perfect world or this is the way things should happen, a little shiver runs up my spine because <laughs> that never seems well, and, to be. I and I think it's because, again, the state system is swamped, and it's not just yeah. Florida. It is the entire country. Uh, it was not built for the unemployment seekers that are just swamping it. And, and so it is really changing by day by day, and I think they're trying to figure out things that work, such as this brand new website that was launched. So um, I think there's going to, the agency is urging patience among Floridians, and I think that's about the 
the best that, that we can ask for, although that is very, very difficult when you're waiting for that paycheck and you got to pay the rent, you got to pay the, the car yeah. payment and the insurance. That is something many Floridians are low on right now, Mike. Thank you. We've got a question for Tim right now. I believe we have full screen for this one. Uh, salons, boutiques, and other shops, Tim, they have been forced to close their doors due to the statewide stay at home. But still, those small business owners, they're going to need to pay rent even without these customers coming in. So what help is available? How can these businesses avoid getting evicted during this time? Yeah, I'll come back to the, the myriad of programs. I think the hard thing for a small business to figure out is, is which one should I apply for. Um, it, you know, the website that you, you mentioned, but also we've had our team just um, around the clock filling uh, our portal. So it's orlando.org slash COVID-19. If you're a business owner, you know, there's, there's all sorts of information from the health standpoint, but from the financial standpoint, what we're talking about now. So our accounting firms and law firms in Central Florida have put up their analysis that they would um, oftentimes provide to their clients that they've uh, allowed us to put on this portal so that small businesses, uh, mom and pops, people with only a couple employees or maybe no employees can figure out what, what all this means. So I would encourage people to, to look into it. I think the, the Florida Business Emergency Loan Program, you got to get your application in. Uh, the Small Business Administration, which is a federal program, the SBA loans, you've got to be talking to your bank about, about that application, and I would be doing that today. Um, there's also other programs that you will find. Those are the main uh, two, the Paycheck Protection Program and the state's Emergency Bridge Loan Program are the two that people should be applying for right now. Um, if you find out in two or three weeks that you don't need it, well, then just put it to the side. But right now, that's what I would be doing if I was a small business. Okay, Tim, thank you. I want to bring in Mayor Demings. That person was asking about evictions, and I believe you made it so people aren't being evicted right now, at least in Orange County. Is that correct, Mayor? Yes, I wanted to chime in on that because uh, one of the orders that the Chief Justice for the Florida Supreme Court uh, ordered statewide uh, inclusive of the Ninth Judicial Circuit was that uh, all circuits should suspend evictions. And so we have confirmed through our local chief judge that uh, here within Orange County, uh, you may be able to go in and fill out paperwork if you are a landlord and you want to proceed with uh, an eviction process. But however, they're suspended. It can't be uh, processed uh, further by the clerk or served by the sheriff. And so that um, uh, suspension of evictions uh, is through, I believe it's April the 19th, and we'll see if uh, the Chief Justice uh, extends that beyond that period of time. But so what I'm saying to you is right now, there's no mechanism to actually evict people within the state of Florida. That won't last forever at some point. Uh, those property owners have a right to be able to reclaim their properties for non-payment, et cetera, uh, but they can't do it right now. Yeah, and, and no one's saying that this is going to be a free pass for folks who just aren't going to be paying rent. At some point, you're probably going to have to pay your landlord. Maybe you can come up with some sort of deal to make up for that in the future to where it's not in one lump sum. Uh, but as the mayor said, no one, there's no mechanism for people to be evicted uh, right now. I do want to bring Pam back in real quick. Pam, one thing that people have brought up, certainly some of the politicians in Florida, some of the bigger name politicians, uh, is that with the unemployment system the way it is now with the stimulus. So in Florida, you get $275 a week. Now the federal government's adding $600 a week, $875 bucks a week. Some people are wondering, are folks still going to try to go get a job while they have these unemployment benefits? What are you seeing when it comes to that? I am seeing people who want to work, Matt. I do not believe that people are going to want to stay at home and collect benefits. In fact, remember, 275 is the maximum benefit that you can get, and that is based on the salary you were earning when you were furloughed or you lost your job. So it's possible that that state benefit may be less, and so certainly people want to go back to work. We're hearing from a lot of people who are interested in going uh, to work for the positions that I talked about that are being uh, advertised by businesses and particularly in the healthcare industry and in those call center, customer care centers. There are a lot of positions open, but also, you know, there are a lot of uh, businesses that are just continuing to recruit in construction. Uh, depending on what kind of construction you're in, there are still businesses. We have some uh, construction businesses that are continuing to recruit. And so I'm 
uh, by and large, people want to work. They don't want to collect benefits. And I, you know, I also want to say that in this um, incredible crisis, young people are also being disproportionately affected. I think I saw a statistic that said one in every four young people who were in a job have now lost that job. You know, people between 16 and 24 who are going through their first opportunity. Career Source is also looking to provide internships this summer. We're still actively uh, taking applications for young people over the summer. It might be a little later summer. Perhaps it will start uh, late June, July, um, based on what the mayor was saying. But um, there are opportunities for young people to get those jobs and get those job skills. So people want to work young, uh, middle-aged, or um, mature workers. So I don't see that happening. Okay, that's good to hear. No age group has been unscathed Lost by it. this, that's for sure. We know the uh, folks in the higher age groups are worried for their lives, folks in the younger age groups worried for their jobs. Uh, it's such a complicated situation. Let's bring uh, back in Tim Giuliani. Tim, we've got another small business owner with a question. This is Zach. He says he's hit a major roadblock when trying to get any assistance here. He says he went to a local bank to apply for an SBA loan, and they just straight up told him they ran out of money. So now he wants to know, is there enough relief to go around? Yeah, that's a good question. One that, that we've also uh, received. Uh, so, so the money has flown through the normal systems. And I think, um, you know, it's been, it's been mentioned a few times today, but it probably can't be understated. Um, we're all in this together. And I think this has hit all of us in unexpected ways and it's overwhelmed systems. And so some banks have hit a cap of what they're of what they're able to lend. Um, some banks are only able to take care of their current customers. So, uh, if you have a, a relationship at multiple banks, um, I would be asking each one because uh, the banks find themselves and the lenders find themselves in different positions on on how they can lend and who they can lend to. Um, we all know it's a, a highly regulated industry, so I would ask multiple banks. The website that I've mentioned a few times, uh, we've put up a list of lenders that are lending, even if you're not a current account holder. So in some cases, these, these may there's a, there's a few banks on the list. There's also a few um, financial institutions that focus on SBA lending and a few fintech companies um, that you might not have heard of before. So we're, we're putting that list together. It's on the site, the orlando.org slash COVID-19, because this is a very uh, challenging thing to navigate for many people, and you, you really have to be proactive. I would keep going. I would tell that person, I think uh, his name was Zach, I would say, don't stop. Call, uh, look at our site. Look at other lenders that might be able to help you. Sounds like persistence is the key uh, in this situation right now. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, another question for Mayor Demings now. This one having to do with something we've talked a lot about on the news here at News 6. Jasmine is interested in that rent assistance program Orange County set up. Uh, we know that they stopped accepting applications at this point, but is there any chance that program gets extended for those who still need the help, Mayor? Where, what, what are you thinking with that program right now? That was a program that we tried to put in place as a stopgap measure between the point that an individual needed crisis assistance and the flow of the federal or the, or the state funds. We uh, anticipated that we would be able to work within our existing budget within Orange County, and we set aside about $1.8 million that we intended to serve 1,500 different families. Well, when we opened up the, the call for assistance, uh, nearly 40,000 people uh, really applied. When we looked at the numbers, there were some duplications within the applications, and it still was 27,000 people that was applying for what we intended to use to serve 1,500. So as a Board of County Commission, we are reassessing our financial capability to see whether or not we extend uh, the program in terms of uh, adding additional money from our budget. But we cut off the number of individuals that could apply for it. Uh, to date, we have uh, processed about 55% of those applications. Uh, there have been some checks that have gone out the door. Those checks go directly to the landlords themselves. But we also have another program, and it's uh, for uh, low-income energy assistance uh, for individuals who need help with paying their utility bills. So uh, if you didn't get in uh, the queue to receive some of the crisis assistance for rent payments, and if you have a challenge of making your 
uh, utility payments, you're able to make application there. We're also trying to work with other social service providers in the community to try to meet some of those unmet needs. Uh, that's what I can tell you at this point. We were uh, notified this week that uh, Orange County will be the direct recipient of some of the CARES Act funding that will come from the Department of uh, the, the Housing and Urban Development within Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, work within providing assistance for uh, individuals who uh, qualify based on income and family size. Uh, those dollars, are, we're still trying to understand how to pull down uh, the several million dollars that we will receive as a community to provide assistance again back uh, to, uh, to our community for those who are in need. So I would tell that person that uh, if they did not get in the queue again to, to uh, apply for the rental assistance to look at, uh, the utility assistance program. Okay, 1,500 people you were hoping to help, and then you got 27,000 applications in about That's three it. days. I know that was certainly overwhelming. I want to bring Pam into the discussion on this one. Do you have anything to add with that question, Pam? Yes, just that uh, Career Source Central Florida has a great partnership um, with United Way, and United Way, of course, 211 is we're referring a lot of individuals who have um, kind of these stopgap needs. They do have some resources and they also have other community partners. They've been convening actually almost a, over 100 community partners to respond and be able to share information. So 211 is a really critical resource uh, to assist our community. Okay, uh, Pam, 211, uh, that's another one of those resources we will certainly be putting on our website, clickorlando.com, adding that in uh, to the mix right there. So thank you for adding in with that information. I want to go back to Tim Giuliani. I know we're getting uh, more questions from small business owners. This one's from a uh, local entrepreneur who says it's really difficult to apply for these loans. One woman uh, said her bank told her she couldn't apply for a loan from a certain bank unless she already had a credit card with them. So the last bank told the guy that they just didn't have any more money left. This person saying she had to have some sort of business credit card with them. So what tips do you have for these business owners? I know you said persistence, uh, but when they encounter these problems, what other options do they have, Tim? Yeah, I, I, I feel for them. Um, I think persistence is, is the answer. Um, there are banks that are still doing SBA loans. There are uh, banks that are still submitting applications for the Paycheck Protection Program. In fact, uh, leaders in Congress are talking about adding more money to the pool. So you, you've got to remain persistent. I know it may be frustrating. I think there's a lot of people in your shoes, um, um, but I would keep going. I would, I would look at our site to see which lenders are still lending. Um, it may not be the banks that you've gone to before. It may be. Um, you need to really stay persistent, look at that list, see who's lending. It may be an SBA lender, which is someone that you might not have worked before, but they work with small businesses all the time. And I would ask you, please be persistent. We need to have um, small businesses taken care of. Uh, many people watching might not real, realize that two thirds of our economy, two thirds of our employment is in small businesses. That's why it's been such a focus of policymakers. We've, we have a survey live on our site. Um, informing policymakers, most small businesses only have enough cash for 12 weeks. So the, the, the bill and the implementation has been done very quickly, which um, probably like the unemployment program creates some problems and some frustrations, but the intent is to get that money out as quickly as possible. And I know the lenders are working, the, the ones I'm talking to are working um, past midnight every night, just trying to fill as many applications and get as many small businesses into the programs. So they're staying persistent. I would ask you, please stay persistent and check our site to see if you can't find another lender that you might be able to work with. Yeah, and the correlation between businesses and individuals is just these systems are overwhelmed. You have yep. to just keep on trying. I wanna bounce back to Mike DeForest real quick, our investigative reporter, Mike. You've been covering this uh, for the last month or so. Have you noticed that things have gotten better? I know you said there was that no, new mobile site up. We've got the paper applications. Does it feel like we're getting some traction and people are actually able to apply for these benefits? It, it was great to get emails this morning from people with exclamation points saying, yay, it went through. It took me five minutes to apply, and that's been a blessing because uh, the last couple of days we haven't heard that story. I think the biggest concern now is uh, the the 
the agency that handles these unemployment benefits, they are trying to build up their capacity to handle this volume. Are we going to get another crush? What happens when more and more businesses start laying off more people as this uh, uh, lockdown extends? Um, hopefully the infrastructure is now in place or will be there to handle the volume, um, but those applications still keep pouring in. Uh, every day like today we start hearing of the new unemployment numbers, and so let's just pray that uh, the system can handle that and they can start catching up with the backlog of people who have uh, applied for help because folks need help right now. Yeah, they certainly do, Mike. Thank you. We've got another question from Mayor Demings. L quite a few people emailing us who say they're on food stamps, they're income limited, they have no transportation, they are unable to get to those grocery stores right now. Has the county partnered with any nonprofit, or have you heard of anybody who is helping people in these situations? What I can say is that with our local uh, bus transit system, the Lynx system has uh, uh, no fares at this point. So if you live near um, a, a bus stop that uh, can get you to your local grocer, I would say uh, look at the Lynx system. That's an opportunity for you. And if you uh, are a person that uh, has special needs, uh, they also have their, their special needs vehicles that are able to trans pe transport people back and forward. So uh, that's what I would tell that person. Uh, and then uh, we certainly have uh, grocery stores now who are doing deliveries for a small fee. Uh, in many cases, um, you, they, they will deliver. If you go online, they'll deliver your groceries directly to your home. Yeah, and, and some of those services are even waiving those fees for the next month. I think Shipt is yes. doing four weeks of free. That's, that's a good call, Mayor. Uh, Pam, I want to bring in for a final thought from you. Anybody who is desperate, really wanting to work right now, what is your number one piece of advice for them? So I would say, you know, call us or go online to our resources because I think there are opportunities to help get you ready for an opportunity. I also would encourage businesses to continue to reach out to us too. We are hearing from businesses who want to hire people. We're hearing from businesses who also want to employ those interns that I talked about earlier, um, whether they are our, our workers that are dislocated from job or our young people. And so it's just very important to reach out to the resources. Again, that number is 1-800-757-4598 or www.careersourcecentralflorida.com. Uh, you'll see the COVID-19 uh, or coronavirus support page right at the top. And there are many resources there, and there'll be a person to talk with you. Okay. Pam, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. We appreciate the whole panel. I do want to give Mayor Jerry Demings uh, one more chance for a final thought here during uh, these certainly difficult financial times, Mayor. What I would say to our community is you've heard a lot today about uh, the job opportunities in our community. The business assistance as well as the crisis assistance that's available. Uh, hopefully we've left our citizens with some hope uh, that we will get through this pandemic. It will not last forever. I believe that we're uh, weeks to months away from returning to some sense of normalcy, although life as we know it uh, probably will change forever. But even if you're a business owner, I think there's an entrepreneurial opportunity here for you to look at your business model. We have businesses who are doing some things now who've been able to maintain uh, some revenue streams because they adjusted their business model. So take a look at that. Uh, if you uh, were an employee, think about the opportunity maybe to uh, develop your own uh, business and uh, take advantage of some of the uh, small business assistance uh, loan funds that will surely flow. We know that our federal, federal government has allocated $2 trillion and likely will allocate even more dollars uh, to be able to assist our, our small businesses in, in our community. So thank you all for being patient with those of us who are in these leadership roles as we're trying to do the best to uh, meet all of your needs. All right. Yes, life is probably forever changed, but it's nice to see a little light at the tunnel to hopefully at least get people out of their houses. Mayor Jerry Demings, thank you so much. We appreciate Tim Giuliani, uh, Dr. Sean Snaith, Pam Neighbors, Investigator Mike DeForest. Thank you all for the wealth of information you gave us tonight. And thank you for joining News 6 and ClickOrlando.com for Central Florida's financial fight. On a personal note, I know these are tough times, but often these trying times, they can be a moment to reassess what you want to do in this life and who 
you want to be. Maybe we can use this as an opportunity to reconnect with our families or really figure out what's important to us in your life and your career. If we do, when all this ends, and it will end, maybe we'll be better off for it. This conversation is not over. We will have much more on News 6 at 11, and we're getting very important resources brought up tonight on ClickOrlando.com. There you can sign up for our daily newsletter. That will help bring you all the latest coronavirus facts, and it'll be emailed right to you. Just click on that newsletter tab at the top of our homepage. Thank you, and have a great night.